uh, slide, but I'm, I'm a research scientist at NSTAR at the University of Colorado, and, and uh, I'm a soft money scientist, so I bring in my entire salary on grants, and I do a variety of things. Um, lately, I've been, a, a few years ago, I was working on CSDMS, a big NSF model coupling project, and um, that project's ongoing, and I served as the chief software architect for that, <clears throat> and a lot of this, in, these current interests kind of came out of that work. But for the last few years, I've been working on uh, EarthCube, NSF EarthCube program funding. And so a couple of the projects are Earth System Bridge, which you can see the logo with the little suspension bridge, and then Ontosoft at the bottom of the screen there. <clears throat> so um, a lot of this talk will be about something that I've developed um, over the last few years, and it was triggered by CSDMS work. Um, but it's developing what's called the Geoscience Standard Names Ontology. So GSN is Geoscience Standard Names. And this, this, is, a, this is work that was born, I didn't, never thought I was going to be the creator of an ontology when I started down this path, but <clears throat> um, you can ask Yolanda, she'll attest to that. She, she, uh, she had to convince me that I needed an ontology in the first place. But um, in the, in the, the basic problem of CSDMS was we had all these models being contributed that were open source computational models. And people wanted to reuse them in, in a plug and play manner and to share them. So if, if you think of hydrology contexts, <clears throat> somebody might have written a really good infiltration component and you would like to use that as part of a larger um, distributed hydrology model, but just that. You just like to pull that piece out and plug it into some other things and, and maybe have the pieces from different authors. And so that was the objective. And, Initially, people were willing to share their code and to, to give it to this uh, to us to, to use, but it wasn't because it was all different computer languages. It was all different uh, uh, computational grids, all different variable names inside, <clears throat> different time stepping schemes. Um, as you can imagine, they weren't just plug and playable. They were all very different heterogeneous things. And so this we got into this issue of well, what what would it take to prepare these so that they could be reused easily into new configurations and how far could that go? How much of that could be automated? And so that's, that's what was a starting point for a series of, of projects that I've been working on ever since, which kind of has culminated into this um, standard names work. Because the last, the last big part of it in terms of mismatch is we can take care of different grids by calling a regridder. We can take care of different units by calling a unit converter. We can do time interpolation to take care of different time steps, but <clears throat> but there's still this problem of different internal vocabularies inside of each of the resources we want to connect. So whether it's a data set with headings at the top of the spreadsheet or whether it's a model that has some abbreviations for some physical variables, there needs to be some way if you're going to automate this for, for a machine to know what the variables you have are and whether you can share them with another model that might want to ingest them. So, so anyway, this first uh, slide here is just showing the different projects from EarthCube, uh, Earth System Bridge, or Onosoft, Geosemantics, they contributed in one way or another to this ontology development. So, so here's uh, kind of the slide I was just talking about in general words, which is, this is kind of the big problem. And it's really a problem of heterogeneity and wanting things to be interoperable and wanting to get that for the lowest price. In other words, you don't want to rewrite or reconstruct these resources. You want to just do something like a thin wrapper or something like that. And you don't want to, uh, you don't want to significantly alter them in terms of having them import things that they didn't have as part of them before. So you want to do really minimal changes to these resources to get them to be automatically plug and playable. And so if you, if you dig into all your various options as you do this, you realize that the only practical way to tame this is through the use of both standardized interfaces um, the first thing I have listed there is actually metadata, but uh, the metadata is just describing the resource and then, then a, an interface for interacting with that resource. So if it's a model, you want to be able to control it uh, at the individual time step level. So it, tell it to initialize, tell it to take a time step and update its variables, tell it to finalize. Um, you also need it to describe itself. So if, if the framework says, what grid do you use? Because I'm going to check to see if it's compatible with the one we're going to connect you to. It has to answer that in a standardized way. Or if I say, what variables do you have to share out um, as output? And what variables would you like to get from another component? I need to have those responses come up to me with standardized terms so that the framework can understand that lingo. And so, so those two things, a standardized interface and a standardized deep description 
of the resource are key because once those are in place, then you can write software like something I'll show towards the end that can automatically connect these resources and adapt for their differences. And it's, it ends up being really cool. So, and I guess it qualifies as an intelligent system because it's, um, it's doing something significantly difficult for you automatically. <clears throat> so um, on that three there, the software that the framework, which is the, where these components get instantiated and selected and coupled, um, it has access to things called mediators or brokers. And based on what it learns from the components that it's connecting, it will automatically call those to fix whatever the problem is. If it's a different grid that has to be regridded before you send the output or units that have to be converted or time steps that have to be interpolated, those are, we have mediators for all of these um, tasks that handle mismatches. And so, so I'm gonna start by talking about uh, variable names a little bit. And this is something that I think most scientists know this intuitively, but I'm just really bringing this to the, to the fore to, to really think about it. And if you think about it, variables really underpin everything we do in science. Um, if you think about what are, what are we store in our data sets? Well, it's the values of variables. It could be sea surface temperature or you know, hydrologic discharge or something. And then um, all the equations in science, all the famous equations of physics and science are really just statements relating different variables to each other. And, and so variables appear as the stars in those. And then we have our computational models <clears throat> are ingesting input variables from either a file or another model and they're producing output variables. And it, when I say variables, I really mean the values of those variables. The variables are the abstraction, the, the symbol. The values are the things that are stored in the file or that are passed read out of RAM or passed you know, read out of a file, that kind of thing. And so, so these variables are, are really symbols, um, usually for our purposes associated with a numerical value, but it could be a string that describes something, and then it often has units. And so, so we end up coming to this idea that um, is very familiar from object-oriented programming, which is that you can think of object in a very broad sense as anything in the physical world that you can observe, like a, a substance or a body or, or a medium of some kind or a phenomenon. And uh, so they're really kind of nouns is one way to think of them. And then um, this is consistent with a little known standard, which I'll talk more about called ISO 80,000 or the International System of Quantities. And they, they think of objects in that same way. <clears throat> and um, then these objects have attributes and they can undergo processes. So what processes could it undergo? Well, a piece of a, a glacier could undergo a process of melting or of calving or of sublimating or sliding. So there's all these different actions that the, the object of a, that you're studying could, could do. And then, um, and, and there's quantities that, that, that quantify those processes, like how fast does it melt or how, how fast does it calve. Um, but then there's, you can sort of divide the quantities in two main types. You can have what's called quantities, uh, which quantify an attribute with a number and it often has units. And so you can think of yourself as the object in height and weight or as, as two quantities. And then there's string type attributes, such as your eye color or your favorite food or something like that. And again, mostly in the computational setting, we're exchanging um, numbers, so numerical attributes. And so, so then we have the object, we have an attribute, in, which is usually a quantity. And then the values are at the actual numbers that you assign to that pair of object and attribute. And so you have this kind of a triple, of, which sometimes is called entity attribute value, but the values are the things stored on the hard drive or in the data file or being passed in and out of the, the models. But we need the other two parts of the name, the entity and the attribute or the object and the quantity to construct a name that will re uniquely refer to that variable of interest. And so just to kind of reiterate here on the slide, another term for these values of variables are exchange items and that is a little broader thinking to say it's not just the values, but what grid are they on and how are they discretized in space and time and what units do they have? So they're the items that pass between uh, the resources that are being connected. <clears throat> and so if you want to construct what would be ideal for this purpose of what I'm gonna talk about is to have a unique descriptive variable name that would be unambiguous, human and machine readable, standardized, so that any variable that we might be talking about like sea surface temperature there would be this one term that we could agree on and use as a hub 
for hub and spoke connectivity. And so the question is, well, how, how could you come up with some rules, some general rules for creating those unambiguous uh, cool names that would span the geosciences that really wouldn't be domain specific. It would avoid jargon and be very um, understandable to most scientists. And so, so that's where we're headed. But then um, just to emphasize this, this point here, the a variable name, if you think about it, has to have two parts, they're essential. So you have to specify an object and you have to specify a quantity um, as of the types we just talked about. And the two ex examples to show why you need both are if you think of temperature, if I saw the word temperature in a model or a data set by itself, I would, my next question would be, well, temperature of what? Is it temperature of snow or soil, air, water? What is it? And the same hydrologic model could have all of those temperatures in it. So there has to be a specification of what the object that the temperature applies to is, and then also the word temperature combined. Similarly, if you just uh, say something like acetic acid, to a chemist, a lot of times they assume that when you say acetic acid, uh, that you're talking about the mass concentration in water or air, whatever the context is. But that's really not a very, it's not an appropriate variable name because um, there's, it, acetic acid is a substance, there, it would therefore be an object, and it can have many different quantities associated to it, like besides mass concentration, it could have the molar mass or its freezing point temperature or the concentration of moles or mass or some other measurement in air or whatever the medium is. And so acetic acid by itself is no good and temperature by itself is no good. But if you start combining object and attribute names, you're, you're getting to something that can be specific. Um, <clears throat> now, even though we started, uh, I started this work just using my own familiarity as a scientist and, and having meetings with communities, um, after a while, I became aware of this, this thing called the International System of Quantities. Now, we've all, we've all heard of the International System of Units, the SI units, um, <clears throat> but there was a sister standard to it called the International System of Quantities, which gave some um, foundations for thinking about quantities. And that was the term they used as well. They used the term quantities. <clears throat> and so it turns out when I, after I had done a lot of this work and found the standard, the thinking that's there uh, is pretty much exactly the thinking that we have in mind, which is that we define objects similarly and we define quantities similarly. And, um, and also, again, as a, as a physicist or a scientist being brought up in the last 30, 40 years, you would have learned about these base quantities um, uh, length, mass, time, electric current, and the others that are there. And you would also learn that most of the, or, or virtually all the quantities you can come up with of any type can be looked at as a composition of those by raising those fundamental dimensions to different powers. And so if you look at the little thing in the lower left corner, that formula, um, the L is for length and the capital T is for time. And so if I took the exponent A to be one and, and C to be minus one, I took all the other exponents to be zero, that would be the representation of, of velocity units, It'd be length per time. Um, similarly, pressure, just anything you can think of as a unit, pretty much would be represented this way, except for some ones that involve logarithms and like pH scale or decibels or ones that have a function wrapped around the, the unit part. So there are, there, and there's some indices too that people define like a, a scale type thing, like a, like a NDVI or, or a drought index. Those are not, not strictly quantities of this type, but they're still considered in the ISO 80,000 as something you might want to view as a quantity. Um, <clears throat> so the starting point for this, again, I kind of mentioned was, um, I was part of this project CSDMS. I was the chief software architect trying to solve problems. And the CSDMS stands for Community Surface Dynamics Modeling System. And we were able to find, we, we tried to reuse as much technology as we could so we found a really great regritter that we could use um, from ESMF from another project. We found unit converters from Unidata that we could use. Uh, we found a lot of the solutions online and we were looking at the CF standard names from the climate and forecasting community as the possible answer to our standard name problem. But it turned out that, that um, there, was a, there were a number of problems with that. One is they didn't want to expand it as broadly as we needed it. They wanted to stay with ocean and atmosphere variables. So there was a scope limitation. But also the rules were not really rules, they were guidelines and there were a lot of inconsistencies. As we looked at them, we realized that they hadn't really thought this through as carefully as we would have liked. 
And so that's what prompted me to start on the path of trying to do something better, but being informed by what they had done and what other groups had done. So I looked at lots of different uh, control vocabulary work to inform this, this effort. And, and I, I've been doing work on it, and then I eventually was able to hire somebody who's working full time on it, who's helped convert it from just standard names to a formal ontology that has everything that goes with an ontology. So, so in that CSDMS work, the typical problem, again, for semantic matching was illustrated by this slide where you have two, two models that are in your, in your collection and they're, suppose they're both hydrologic models. And one of them in its internal variable names says it has stream flow and rain rate as outputs. And the other one says in its internal name says that it wants discharge and precip rate as inputs. And so to a hydrologist, you would say, well, stream flow and discharge are usually the same thing. And rain rate and precip rate are most likely the same thing. So there, this may be compatible for coupling that one can provide to the other, A can provide to B. But um, that required me as a hydrologist who knows domain jargon and also looking in the code as what the variable names in the code were before I could come to that conclusion. And we want this to be a, a system of a lot of different components that have many variables each that can be coupled automatically by a machine. And so that, that's not going to work. And so what we did was with the standard names, the blue box here is a, is a, is a, a couple of longer, more descriptive names that have been constructed according to rules, which I, I won't get into the full rules, but the part before the double underscore in those two names is the object, and the part after it is a very specific quantity. And so then I'm mapping, so then if, if I have the, the red and white arrows represent some kind of a mapping or a lookup table where the author of the model makes a matching from that variable in their code to one of our standard names, and and the other author does that as well. And then now if the system, if the framework has the two mappings, it can see automatically that these are compatible for coupling. And it doesn't need to ask a human about it. But to make sure it's reliable, we have to make sure that an expert signs off on the mapping initially. The expert, whoever wrote the model, says, yes, this thing in your system is exactly the right concept. And that's, that's the variables I'm passing around or the values I'm passing. So one question here. Um, yeah. And uh, what about uh, the the units of measure? What if it's the right concept but with different units of measure? How do you handle that? That's a good question. So we divide this problem up into parts. So the first thing is to have the the object and attribute specified to get the concept. But then once you have that, that becomes like a key, and that key is used. To, it's, it's, it's sent to functions, to interface functions, to either ask for the values that go with that variable, or the rank of the array, or the units, or anything else that we want to know about how, the, how that model handles that variable. So if one function will return me an answer to tell me what, what long variable names are available or wanted. But then once, I, once the framework knows that, then it can ask a follow-up question through another interface function and say, OK, you said you had this variable. What units do you use for it? What grid do you use for it? what, you know, everything else you want to know about that variable would then be provided through follow-up questions to other functions. And this is partly because we don't want to overload the name with too much information. The name is really kind of a, a key to identify a concept. And then once, you, once we're sure about this concept being the same in the two models, we can go on to ask how each model uh, treats that variable internally. Maybe one of them- No, I agree, I agree. Yeah, from from one, the modeling perspective, I think that that's the correct decision. Yeah. Yeah, and one, one of the models might have it be a point value at a, at a station tower or something. The other model might have it be a 3D array. And so it's, it could be it could have mismatches in terms of the rank of the array or the spatial coverage or the units or lots of other things. Or, or also assumptions. And assumptions is something that's a little trickier. You know, when you think about measuring temperature, there's wet bulb and dry bulb and there's all kinds of, uh, or even standard temperature and pressure doesn't just mean one thing anymore. There's like three or four standard temperature and pressure definitions. And so, so all that follow-up information that you would want to be sure about something, we, we use this as the key to go get more when you need more. Um, okay. And that's, that's a difference between our system and some of the others out there because some of the others will try to put assumptions in the name or units in the name. But then they, uh, they run into these issues of super long names or just cluttering the, the space of the name. Mm -hmm. could, you, 
Good. Uh, wait, no, 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 no. Since you were answering questions there, yeah. one one simple example, which uh, uh, would be interesting to see how you uh, uh, how you would address it, is just uh, things that have state changes uh, across different areas. So you have water, but then again, snow. Uh, snow is handled very differently, and it is, so snow is water, but snow is water with different volumes, or snow has different volumes. Right. Um, and different, and how, how would you handle that when you got into a, uh, when you saw two guys arguing about it? Well, so we thought a lot about that. I mean, cause I'm a hydrologist, that was one of the things <clears throat> on my mind as well. And, um, and it's a very interesting thing to think about. And it shows you that when we talk of like these two models talk about rain rate and precip rate, they're really not being specific enough because there's about seven distinct concepts that you could associate to rainfall or snowfall or, or whatever. And one of the things they do in, in the uh, modeling and the meteorology world is they talk about liquid equivalent precipitation rates. So they say, yes, the snow, the, this material could be falling in different densities based on the temperature and it could be different densities, different times during the same event. Like it could go from grapple to snow to ice to slush or something or sleet. And those would all have different densities. Um, so how can I then quantify the rate at which it's falling? If I do it as a volume flux, that's not a good idea because that's volume per area per time, but the volume depends on the density. I could do mass flux, which would be mass per area per time, and that would get rid of the density issue. Or I could say, let's look at liquid equivalent rates. So let's imagine I melt it before it hits the ground. Then how much is there? So there's, there's about seven different uh, distinct um, precip concepts that we've sussed out and we've done this for any variable we have we've really thought carefully about that kind of issue like if i just say heat capacity is that enough to pin it down or do i have to say more do i have to say isobaric mass specific heat capacity um and usually you do you have to say more because we're, we have to get to a unique unambiguous concept so i, I might have a slide coming up on that but that was, that's a good question and we we have anticipated those things um so here's a few just basic examples kind of show the pattern that the CSD mess names we're using, which is to say, let's do the object part, which is orange here. Let's do a quantity part, but then something else enters in, which is this optional bracketed part in yellow, which is an operation name. And that, that's something that also occurs very commonly in models and in data sets where I'm looking at some operation on the, applied to the quantity, like the time derivative of elevation is shown on here, or the, some kind of an integral, an area integral over a basin or some other operation. Or it could be a function like the log of elevation. <clears throat> and so what we noticed is that semantically, when humans talk about these operations, they always say of at the end. So you say the Laplacian of this or the time derivative of this or the sine of this. And so of in our system becomes a uh, delimiter that we use to, for, the, for the machine to tell when an operation is done. And we also, in our upper ontology define, we, we look at the action of operations and all operations do is they act on quantities and they can create new quantities. And so when I apply time derivative to elevation, I'm gonna get a new quantity, but I'm going to have units that have been modified now to have a per time. And if I do some kind of I do mass and I do a flux, then that's gonna be a per unit area per time that's added to the units. And so you, you look at these, um, it, it turns out we, we've identified like 150 different operation names that are also important to capture all the names that occur in, in models and data sets. So those are, our, those are the basic parts. And the, again, the double underscore, we, we wanna serialize these names for the purpose of the matching. And so we've, but in our ontology, they're not serialized, they don't have to be. They actually have little RDF packets of, of statements. But, in the serialized form, they have a double underscore to separate the object and the quantity part. They have of to separate the operations, which can be chained. And then they have tildes, which are shown here for adjectives and uh, hyphens to bind words together. So there's five, five uh, delimiters we use. In okay, fact, so it, 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 for that last case, is it uh, on the last slide? Yeah. You have, then it's, so you, in the case of a parser, you would always look for an of first and then look for double underscore or is because you have the soil, you have the object name and quantity name, 
do you just assume that if you do not have of, then it is, and then the next parsing mechanism is on two underscores. Is that correct? Uh, the two underscores comes first. So it's first. It's you, if you're parsing left to right, you you keep hitting words which are part of the object name until you hit a double underscore, which is white in this example. Then okay. you then you start looking for what comes next until and if you see an of, you keep pulling off words that end in of and say those are one or more operations which don't have to be. Got there. it. Got and it. The nice. Part is the quantities, and so so you don't uh, you don't have to machine parse it to understand it or work with it. But this makes it very easy to like convert the words into an ontology or do things with it because everything is easily extractable and very rules based. Nice. And it creates a nice alphabetization too. I won't be able to get into everything in detail, but when people are trying to find a match of their concept because they're the developer of a model in this list, we want things to alphabetize. And so when the adjectives come up, like on this next slide, they, they trail the object name. So, so here's the five delimiters I just talked about, double underscore, single underscore, hyphen, tilde, and the word of. But then, and again, we're shooting for human readable and machine actionable. So then if, in order to set the context, I, I have the object side really be kind of like to have some sort of nesting usually. So I'd say, talking about the C and the C has some water. So you can read these underscores almost as a has a. So C has some water, water has some phosphorus, and then the tilde tells you that the phosphorus is dissolved and are inorganic. And by trailing the adjectives, all the phosphorus variables will sort together alphabetically, even if they're organic or not dissolved or whatever. <clears throat> and then, then the double underscore, then the operation, then the quantity. And in the, sec in the second example, there's actually two, op two operations, elevation angle of the gradient angle of potential vorticity. And so, um, what we've done is on this object part, it's too much to get into now, but in this example, it indicates kind of a simple nesting that drills, it's a drilling down from a broader concept to a more specific object or part of the object. That works in a lot of cases. There are other cases where the underscore means something different and we formalize that in our ontology to, to give you context. So the, the words, a lot of the words on the left before you get down to phosphorus are really establishing context and they provide alphabet alphabetical characteristics. So all the C variables go together, all the atmosphere variables go together. Um, and so I had done a lot of work scoping this initially and in collecting uh, online resources. And so I have, those still exist and they're at the CSDMS Wiki page and they have extensive um, links to Wikipedia pages for people to, to sort of follow the reasoning and see what was going into this, uh, this thing. So those links are here, but but now, uh, as of about the last year or so, we're moving this whole thing into a formal ontology that uses semantic web best practices. And so now we have a Sparkle endpoint. People can launch queries against the ontology and pull out parts that they want. Um, <clears throat> they can pull it into Protege and look at how it's structured. And and so we realized, at, uh, in order to really share this kind of a thing with the community that would be interested it had to be taken to the next level. It had to use best practices for semantic stuff. And so we had to bring ourselves up to speed on that. And I hired a person and they, that's all they do now is to, to help bring it to that level and to add new, new things for different domains. So geostandardnames.org is one of the links. Um, we have multiple um, uh, domain names that are all cross-linked right now. And there's, you can see some of, some of what's there so far on that page. So, as we, I won't get into these slides by reading them in detail, but, but what we found in this upper ontology work is that there's really sort of eight core entities that you need to be thinking about for the purpose of this ontology. And so the variable names we talked about, and they're composed of object and quantity names, <clears throat> and they could have operation names. And then process names, um, they, one of the ways they come up is they often appear in a quantity name. So like infiltration rate, would be a, a quantity that's trying to quantify the rate at which a, pro a particular process occurs. And there's lots of other ones, like a vibration frequency would be a, a quantity that quantifies the, the process of vibration. Um, so, so that they end up being important as well. And we've got a rule for how to, to um, identify them, which is basically any process name, like physical process name, is a, uh, a noun that was derived from a verb. 
So a good example is you take the verb infiltrate, which is what the water is doing, and you take the standard rule to turn it into a noun, and it becomes infiltration. <clears throat> but the ending doesn't always have to be T-I-O-N. It could be like delivers, delivery, um, uh, subside is subsidence. So they have a, a few different standard endings to get them to be nouns. But um, that's a very general rule that we found that works nicely. And then there's the numerical grid. Like we said, you need to know both for data sets and for models, what's, how did you discretize space for, for these values? What do these values mean in terms of on the ground? And then assumption names, which can be used as decorators throughout to, to add additional information to something. And, um, and then science domain names to give you a sense of what domain is applied to. And that just helps with filtering. When we're showing somebody a lot of things, this way we can just show them the hydrology terms or some subset of the entire huge collection. And so what does the GSN have so far? Well, we've been at this for a while and we're able to uh, look at models like there's a really big popular ocean model called ROMS, Regional Ocean Modeling System. And it has so many different ocean variables. It has like 500 plus. And so if you get all those names mapped, our thinking is that you've got most of any ocean models names mapped. Same with WARF. WARF is an atmosphere model that's uh, it's very widely used, very powerful, sophisticated. It has about 268 distinct names. And then the CF standard names, which I mentioned earlier, is ocean atmosphere variables. And we've mapped, now it's up to about 80% of those 2,600 names. And then we went into other fields like hydrology, uh, glaciology, snow hydrology, um, sediment transport variables. And so we're, some of these were because we worked with a particular community through a meeting. We'd have a meeting with the deep earth process people, or we'd have a meeting with the environmental chemistry people and try to understand their issues and make sure that these rules would work in their context. Um, other ones are just all the physical constants. You know, there's a limited number of those. There's a limited number of mathematical constants. Lots of dimensionless numbers like Reynolds number, Fruit number, they come up in, in modeling. And then lots of parameters that come up in empirical formulas like Manning's N or, or the law of the wall roughness parameter. And so we're now with, with all those different types of variables, um, all being the same set of rules, we're up to something like 12, 13,000 geoscience variable names and they, they're not specific to a single domain, they really are cross domain. And, and a lot of them are they're driven by something that we actually saw in a model. So we know that they're, we're not just working in a space that's not needed. We're picking the names that are needed for these types of work. With the environmental chemistry, um, if we did all of chemistry, we would be talking about 65 million chemical species or whatever. Um, if we restrict to environmental, we get down to something more like 10,000. And that's where most of this 12,000 comes from, actually, is, is from that uh, chemistry stuff. So then um, these are some of the current numbers or not too long ago numbers for how many in each category we have. And so you can see there's about 130 operation names, about 1300 process names. I, I don't think there's gonna be a whole lot more physical process names out there because we've kind of been hammering on this for a while. The assumption names is gonna grow a lot. And th this is, um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about this, but <clears throat> when, two, when two scientists are meeting talking about a model, they throw a lot of strings back and forth at each other and they'll say uh, to, to say what their model's doing or how they change some existing models. They might say, yeah, I'm using the Boussinesque approximation. That's an assumption in the string. I'm solving the uh, Reynolds average and average Stokes equations. I assume the no-slip boundary condition, I, whatever. And so we have a lot of standard uh, lingo that scientists use to, to in, talk about boundary conditions or dimensionality or the rheology assumptions like Newtonian fluid or the equations that are actually being solved or the numerical method that's actually being used. And so we're trying to capture a bunch of those as well so they can be used as decorators to attach to the rest of the, the parts of this and to really fully describe the, the guts of what a model is doing. Because every model makes assumptions and simplifications. And we want to try to capture those um, because compatibility isn't necessarily just about variables being the same, but they might have to have some some other principles in common before they can be coupled to, to form a valid model. And so this, um, this slide here is showing you a little bit how, how um, physics sort of guides us on this path. We don't have to do something that's very arbitrary. We just have to see patterns that are across the sciences already. And, and this is one slide that illustrates that. So if you think of 
of um, most modeling is based on conservation laws, uh, conservation of, of carbon or water or, or energy mass, something, momentum. And so there's these seven or so things that are, that are the things you could conserve that are typically found in models. And then, um, then you do your standard control volume approach where you have either stuff accumulating within a control volume or coming into it or out of it. And so that gives rise to fluxes and flow rates and concentrations and refractions and diffusivities for each of those um, seven fundamental things. And similarly, once you've got a flux of them, you can look at the divergence of X flux or the Z integral of that X flux. And in this, in this thing, the U is just whatever the units were in green up above for the conserved quantity. And the other units in white are whatever is implied by that particular operation or quantity. And so you can see that even across all these sciences, there's a pattern that we can tap into. Now, in the case of um, electricity or charge, if charge is a thing flowing, they don't say charge flux. And um, they say, let me minimize my thing here. So when they, instead of charge flux, which is really what it is, um, they say electric current density. Instead of charge flow rate, they say electric current. And so it's okay if there are jargon differences between the standard name hub and the rest of the world, but by keeping them consistent like this, people who are outside of a given domain can, can be very clear about what we're talking about. These are almost self-defining in the way that they get written out. Um, and, and then individual domain jargon can be, can be mapped into this, into this hub. Um, so, so then also the importance of, <clears throat> of operations. Um, I, I mentioned this earlier, but you, you just can't find a model or a data set that hasn't, hasn't applied some mathematical operation to a quantity. It's very seldom just quantities only. There's usually some mathematical stuff. If it's a vector field, they might have to be talking about a component of it. If it's a, uh, uh, or the magnitude of it. If it's a scalar field, you might want to talk about the gradient, like salinity or temperature. And so there's all these mathematical operations that, that have to come along for the ride. And again, most of them have pretty well-defined names. Um, but as you can see at the bottom here, they, they, some of these apply to a vector and return a scalar. Some of them apply a scalar and return a vector. Some are vector to vector, some are tensor to scalar. And so keeping track of how of their usage, how they're appropriately used, can help somebody in constructing new variable names and to also be part of the ontology. So this last part here um, is, is a, just a very brief discussion of how I've used some of this stuff. So I wrote this Python uh, framework called Emily. So, and Emily is supposed to kind of make you think of an intelligent system, right? Some kind of intelligent actor when working on your behalf. And it's, uh, the acronym was, was sort of forced to get it to be EMILY, but it's Experimental Modeling Environment for Linking and Interoperability. And TopoFlow is a hydrologic model that I have used, that I developed, um, that has multiple options for different processes. And over the years, I've had TopoFlow implemented different ways, but now it's implemented as a set of plug and playable components. So this is a, a figure from a paper we just got published in, a, in the GPF um, series that Yolanda was, was leading on reproducibility. And what's in the brown boxes here are multiple alternate components for a given process. So I could do the, the flow routing with kinematic wave or dynamic wave or diffusive wave. Or I could do the infiltration part of the model with Green Amped or Smith Parlange or Richards 1D. And I could do the evaporation with these other three or snow melt with these two. And so basically, um, a person setting up a model run would pick one from each brown box and then the others. And uh, it, you don't have to pick glacier if there's no glacier in their problem. But then, then you can see all the arrows of the connectivity that has to happen as variables get passed between these different things. So the arrows sort of show you that, you know, there's, there's connections between the variables of these different components. They need to have information from each other as they're running. And so as one component updates its, its variables after a time step, then in the next time step of the snowmail component, it will need to use those latest variables to get its own latest variables. And so these things are chattering away during runtime, <clears throat> uh, just nonstop. And rather than having a user have to learn about the 100 or, 50, 100 or 200 variables that are involved in this communication, 
we prepare each of these components, each of these blue circles with the, this BMI interface, which part of that is to map their internal names to standard names. And then Emily instantiates whichever components it's, have been selected from this list just by listing their names. There's a provider file where you just say the name of each component you want to use. Then Emily will instantiate those, that, those choices. It will call the BMI function to find out what each one has and what each one needs. It'll make sure that every need is met by another component in the collection. And if it isn't, it'll say you need another component because there's a missing variable, or it'll say you're overdetermined because you have two components for producing that variable. Um, but if everything's not neither under or overdetermined, it'll just run it. And it, it then automatically instantiates each of these models, automatically connects them, automatically mediates for any differences in the grids or the or the units or or those things. And all the user had to do was list the components they want to use. And in principle, those components could be from all different authors. Um, they could be different languages in the case of the CSDMS framework. And again, all those differences will be dealt with by the framework itself so that the user has just minimal amount of, um, of work to, to, to use these models in, in composite ways. Um, so I, this next part, I don't have to go into because I think we're getting low on time now, right? How are we doing right now? We're, we're actually a little bit over right now. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll just like flash through these. Just say that we're developing an app to collect this model metadata from a, a model developer or to let people browse model metadata that's already been collected with a, uh, an app that would work in a browser or, or iOS or Android. And it's written in something called Ionic, and that's talked about a little bit here, which is a powerful cross platform app development tool. It's used by Flyover Country, if you've heard of that. But, um, and these are some of the um, screen captures of this new app with the ability to, to browse through models, to look at high level metadata for models and then to look at very low level metadata, either just to look at it or to annotate a model with this data. And it has links to Wikipedia pages embedded. The Wikipedia links are part of the ontology so that this can automatically be provided to the user. Uh, in the app. And there's a tutorial uh, in the app that's built in and lists of assumptions and domains and so forth they can choose from. And so we collect that stuff from, from the users um, in this app on the right, <clears throat> put it in a holding tank, periodically pump it up into the ontology, have some light vetting, making sure the rules are, are not broken, and then it becomes available to future people to, to describe their resource. And so, and this last thought is, we wanted, we saw from CF and from other groups that there, the governance can be a real issue because governance, if, if every name, if there aren't good rules, every name becomes a big long discussion to figure out whether it's appropriate. And that is, that means this committee for CF meets once a year and they plow through a, a bunch of names and then they usually don't finish because there's too many. And it's restrictive to the process and by, we, we believe by introducing much better rules and by more structure, um, we can guide a user through a construction of a name and have it be almost exactly what we would do um, with just some light bit and needed to, to polish it up. And that's, that's it. And at the end of this talk, I've, since we're gonna share this talk, um, at the end I've, I've embedded uh, the URLs, DOIs to a number of papers that I've written over the last few years on some of these topics. The one that's, um, on the second page here, Emily 1.0 will tell you all about Emily. And then there was a follow-up one that just came out in, uh, by Jiang et al, 2017, which is something called Emily Web, where it's, it's Emily, but Emily allowing the models to run as services on different servers. And so that's, that's now functioning. And so that's it. That's great. Thank you so much. Are there any questions 